会同仁，大家早。因为我们是正在等那个 Professor Myron Cohen online， 可是他是纽约时间晚上，他目前还没上线。那因为他上礼拜有先预录。所以我们就想，因为我们的时间也都安排好了哈，我们就先播放他预录的影片，然后现在我们一边跟他联络，等一下让他在 Q&A 的时候跟大家讨论。好，那本来我准备了一个英文的开场白，现在我就用中文讲了，因为因为反正跟所里的同仁，就是我们这个是第四届的李议员先生的纪念讲座。那前面三届呢都办得很顺利、很成功，这一届呢，我们也感谢少华哈，是 Marion Cohen 的学生，然后他安排也联络，也准备了这些讲稿啊等等的哈，感谢少华。那呃，今天那个 Professor Marion Cohen 的讲题，我想你们都收到了，就是 Middle Class Confrontations, Post Traditionalism and Fragmentation in China Ethnographies。主要是要探讨那个当代最新的，呃，中国那个中产阶级的兴起。那他觉得我们台湾的研究，呃，应该可以跟大陆就是一起做哈，呃，不要忽略哪一方。而且两岸的这个研究应该是有贡献于世界的人类学哈，这个议题。呃，等一下我们就是听他录影。那我现在先请少华对 Professor Myron Cohen 做一个 brief， 呃。Uh, introduction, 这样子，好。好，谢谢所长。呃，现呃呃现场的各位同仁，还有线上的朋友，大家早哦。那个，呃，因为那个之前就是担心有技术问题，因为他是他的晚上在在在家里，然后旁边没有别人可以帮忙，所以但之前的担心技术问题，所以他就有要求先预录，以免今天出状况。所以我有我们比较担心是。他那边又出状况，因为那天预录的时候，其实就一直有些卡卡的。那我们就在等他上线的时候，我就先简单介绍一下那个 Marion。呃，我们李议员讲座，呃，历来的讲者都非常的精彩，但是我们今年请来的 Marion Cohen 教授，大概是我们历年李议员讲座讲者里面跟李议员先生的关系最久远的一位哦。那 Marion 他是美国哥伦比亚大学人类学系与东亚研究院的教授哦，然后他是国际很著名的汉学家、客家研究的专家。哦，他上来了，看到他的头了。Hi Marion。Hello, hello, hello, hello. <laughs> yeah, I'm introducing you to my to the audience. Okay. 那他是一九六三年就来台湾研究，以前我读书的时候，他就说你还没有在台湾的时候，我就在台湾了。<笑>那一九六四年，他开始在美农进行他的博士论文的田野调查。那本论文呢，后来是非常出出版之后非常轰动。那本论文叫做《House United, House Divided》。那这本论文呢，就是二零一六年我们所的黄秀瑞老师，呃，他在。二零一六年的时候，他将这本论文翻译成中文哦。然后这本书对于那个传统华人亲属跟社会客家研究的影响非常的重要。那我觉得在呃最重要的就是岳麦润，他是那个六零年代开始来台湾做研究的这些汉学家，但是他也是那一代当中非常少数，一直到现在都持续来台湾做研究的人类学者。如果不是疫情的关系，他几乎年年都来。然后他到现在都还在持续整理跟撰写美农的研究。那我想跟大家分享的是，二零零八年的时候，他获得美农开庄两百多年来第一位荣誉证明的荣衔。然后，那二零一六年的时候，呃，行政院客委会呢又颁给他一等客家事务专业奖章，就感谢他对台湾客家研究的个贡献。他是第一位获得这位奖章的外籍人士哦。那二零一七年，李议员先生过世。那二零一八年呢，清华大学主办李议员先生教授纪念研讨会的时候，那 Marion 教授也发表了《清代美容客家社会的形成》这样的书。那另外非常值得一提的是 ，Marion 他他前些年就开始陆续整理早年在美容的田野照片，而且将那些照片跟资料档案捐回台湾哦。所以二零一四年的时候呢，高雄市。
呃，高雄市政府的课课委会呢，就出版了一本《回望二十世纪的美浓》，一九六零到一九九零年代的摄影典藏一书，里面就收录了非常多 m y r o n 呃，很重要的田野照片，很精彩啊。然后，二零一七年的时候，台北市客家文化主题公园也举办那个孔麦龙教授的田野照片的回顾展，人类学的回顾展哦。那我就想顺便提一下，大家都知道那个。林生祥的交工乐队，然后也在林生祥的那个很有名的歌的那个词的创作是钟永峰先生了、哦。那钟永峰先生他出生的火房就是 Myron 做田野的地方。那钟永峰先生知道 Myron 这几天要来演讲，所以他就很蛮激动了，他就写了一篇短文了。那他我我我觉得很有趣，他寄给我看，我就想跟大家分享一下。他他第一句话是这样说，他说二零一六年十二月二十五日。当我被领进台北市政府文化局长的办公室，回顾来时路，他心想：若非当年有位人类学家住进我家，启发后来这一切，像我这样的南部客家烟农之子，何德何能哦？所以他非常的呃感谢 m a r o n 对他们的客家的文化运动，或者是他们的这种，呃，不管是艺术创作什么，有非常非常重要的启发哦。那前几年那个。m a r o n 教授，他也将他历年来在美容收集的各式文献的影本资料捐赠给哥伦比亚大学的东亚博物图书馆哦，因为他之前收集的那些文献就是影本了，因为正本少呃就是 copy 完了，他就还给报道人了。可是他在捐赠给哥伦那个图书馆之前呢，他也将所有的影本他自行扫描成电子档，分类整理。那二零一六年的时候，就将电子档捐赠给台湾的四个机构。然后包含我们所，但是那份档案非常的珍贵。我有请过那个客家客委会的专家来看，大家都觉得是非常稀奇。那很希望那份那些档案能够再进一步的整理，能提供未来的后进，能够做研究之需要。那今那我就先介绍 m a r o n 教授到这里。然后我想我他已经上线了，我们是不是就欢迎他 m a r o n Myron, would you like to speak something? Oh, okay. Well, I'm uh, uh, I'm delighted to be here, and uh, I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, not only uh, uh, honor my long affiliation with the uh, Institute of Ethnology and my uh, many fine colleagues there, but also to uh, express in my own way. Uh, my uh, appreciation uh, and uh, uh, remembrance of Professor Lee Iran, uh, who I knew for many, 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 many years, and who was instrumental in helping me develop my own uh, anthropological interest and my own interest in uh, uh, Taiwan uh, uh, and uh, China. So once again, I am very grateful for this opportunity, not only to express certain of my uh, views, but also to uh, be once again closely involved with uh, 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 my my colleagues in the uh, Institute of Ethnology. Thank you. Okay. Play your recording first, and then what? it will be followed by your by the QA session. Excuse me. What? Oh, okay. You want me to read it now, or? It's fine. On this occasion of the uh, Lee E. Yuan Memorial Lecture. During his lifetime, Professor Lee E. Yuan occupied a central position in China anthropology, for in his own work, he bridged several important divides that then characterized the field. One was as between the Western, largely American and English anthropological scholarship on China and the, and the Chinese language scholarship, which was then mainly based in Taiwan. Another was as between the study of Han and the non-Han within the framework of China or Taiwan. Yet another was as between the Han in China or Taiwan and overseas Chinese communities. And yet another was as between synchronic and diachronic ethnographies with the latter now commonly referred to as historical anthropology. Finally, and fundamentally, 
he bridged the divide between China and Taiwan anthropology precisely by ad advocating the study of Taiwan as having its own value for anthropological scholarship. Professor Lee's broad range of interests defines an anthropology that contemporary research can readily fit into, but one which is surely lacking among many present day researchers themselves. Nevertheless, in shortly turning to some issues in the ethnographies of present day China and their implications for Taiwan, it will, I hope, be in his spirit of advancing the anthropology of this part of the world. I had known Professor Li Yuan since my first arrival in Taiwan in 1962. During my first year in Taipei, I was a frequent visitor to the Institute of Ethnology, had many opportunities to meet Professor Lee and discuss my fieldwork plans with him. And then I spent a year and a half in Mainong in Kaohsiung County with periodic returns to Taipei and to the Institute. After leaving Taiwan in 1964, I returned during the summers of 1966 and 1967, both times associated with Professor Morton H. Freed's summer seminar on Chinese culture for American college teachers and graduate students. I mentioned this because each summer, one of the invited speakers was Professor Lee. His 1966 talk concerned his fieldwork in a Taiwanese village in Zhanghua, and the one he gave in 1967 was on his research on the overseas Chinese. According to my notes taken in 1967, and I quote from them, Professor Lee was then teaching at Taida, had studied at the Department of Anthropology in the Peabody Museum, and was an associate re research fellow at the Academia Sinica. He was notable, and this is in my notes, he was notable for being the first local scholar to study Han communities. Professor Lee was fully engaged with and instructively and constructively critical of the English language anthropological literature on China at that time as well as with the mainly American English speaking anthropologists who had been coming to Taiwan since the late 1950s to do field work. Their focus overwhelmingly, although not exclusively, was on Han culture and society. And their presence in Taiwan was due both to the welcome they received as researchers and to the fact that at that time, access to the China mainland was restricted. Thus, Li Yuan was hardly contained within the framework of Taiwan anthropology to which he made such formidable contributions. For he also served as a mentor for many young anthropologists coming to Taiwan to do fieldwork at both the graduate and postgraduate levels. I was among those who benefited from his support in many ways. He was director of the Institute of Ethnology by the time that I, now with a recent PhD and an appointment as assistant professor at the Columbia University Department of Anthropology applied for visiting scholar status with the Institute. This was shortly forthcoming due to the positive and cooperative attitude which Professor Lee consistently displayed towards foreign scholars seeking to do research in Taiwan. This was for another stint of fieldwork in Mainong, which Burton, Pasternak, and I carried out in 1971-72. From that time on, my frequent visits to Taiwan for conferences and for further research kept me in contact with Professor Lee until his passing. Professor Lee's engagement with the anthropology of the Han, either in mainland China, Taiwan, or overseas, certainly provided a ready intellectual link with the fieldwork interests of the anthropologists coming from abroad, mainly from the United States and some from Western Europe. Their focus, and I was one of them, was largely on what I have called traditionalism, namely an interest in the culture of the Han Chinese as this in Taiwan expressed continuity with late imperial China, especially during the Qing dynasty. Key figures in this traditionalist anthropology included my professor, Morton H. Fried, and also Professor Mars Friedman. The latter loomed especially large in this traditionalist anthropology, and Li Yuan in his own publications, addressed often critically some of Friedman's work. But Li Yuan's ethnographic gaze was broad-based, as befitted his status as a public intellectual, writing on critical issues in contemporary Taiwan. For example, 
while foreign anthropologists might see in large scale religious rituals manifestations of tradition rooted in China's imperial past, Professor Lee indeed saw them as expressions of Han culture, but placed them squarely in the context of contemporary of the contemporary scene in Taiwan, with a focus on key associated issues, including his classic critique of urban-based hostility or impatience with local religious ritual. Professor Lee was at ease in dealing with, as an anthropologist, with both tradition and social change, and so he must have been well prepared for the major transformation of China anthropology during his lifetime, with the opening of mainland China for fieldwork. If the major endeavor of Taiwan anthropology study of the ethnic Han during the 1960s and 1970s focused on dimensions of culture and society harking back to the Qing dynasty, there remained in the background a powerful but unsatisfied curiosity regarding contemporary China. The opening up of China to fieldwork initiated a period of new concerns with the present in terms of China research to be sure, but also for anthropology in Taiwan. The middle class transformation of society on both sides of the Taiwan Straits created the environment for a new phase of anthropological research. For China anthropology, this middle class has become a defining element in the study both of those who are in it and of those marginal to it. Middle class characteristics now dominate as themes in this anthropology, ranging from the emergence of individualism and the triumph of the commodified and commodity seeking self to the struggle for place in an insecure and rapidly changing class setting, to nationalism, and even to the impact of automobile ownership. Contrast with Taiwan highlight and make explicit how the China ethnologists share a framework of research and analysis, albeit one not defined by shared theoretical approaches, but nevertheless one which might usefully and critically be expanded to include areas of concern expressed in Taiwan. In the movement of English language anthropological studies of Han culture, from a Taiwan-focused traditionalism to a China-focused modernism, the trend increasingly has been to give attention to what some of these works describe as the new middle class. Certainly, however it is defined, its rapid emergence and expansion has attracted much scholarly and popular attention. Take, for example, the following statements from a recent report by the Center of Strategic and International Studies. Now I'm quoting, based on the Pew Research Center's income ban classification, China's middle class has been among the fastest growing in the world, swelling from 39.1 million people, 3.1% of the population in 2000, to roughly 707 million, 50.8% of the population in 2018. This amounts to an increase of 667.9 million or 47.8% increase. The, the fascination with this increasingly large segment of China's population most interestingly parallels that of the old traditionalism's enchantment with the culture and society of late imperial China. Actually, the anthropological encounter with post Maoist China began, as far as foreign anthropologists are concerned, early during the period of reform and opening up, that's as it is called, thus predating formation of the expanded middle class that was later to be the object of much anthropological interest. During the 20th century, last couple, during the 20th century's last couple of decades, foreign anthropological research in China was largely concerned with that country's rural sector, including an early phase where studies of non-Han communities and ethnic groups loom large, if not dominant, as far as, far, as far as foreign anthropologists in China were concerned. It was during this early period, following the initiation of the post maori reforms, that some of the anthropological models and concepts which had characterized the traditionalist anthropology of Taiwan and Hong Kong were applied to the China ethnographies. For example, my own 1985-1986 research in Hebei applied with some success my understanding of family organization as developed 20 years earlier in Taiwan, even though this earlier research was heavily traditionalistic and in many ways a critical response to arguments concerning the Chinese family as it was during the Qing dynasty. In other words, a purely traditionalistic approach. In Taiwan, I related my research to the question as to whether the joint family was characteristic of the imperial Chinese elite, the so-called gentry, 
or was rather a developmental phase in a pattern of family organization embedded in Han Chinese culture as such. And I'm referring here to the joint expanded family. This question was totally within the framework of the traditionalist anthropology of that time. Su suggesting that the anthropology of Taiwan was really that of the Qing dynasty, albeit that the latter had already been gone for 70 years when I did my field. In Hebei, however, the focus of my field work and its subsequent analysis was on changes in family arrangements under the impact of collectivization and other factors introduced since the onset of communist rule. I still had an historical orientation, but my aim was to account for changes leading up to the present situation. In other words, my effort was not to contribute to the anthropology of the Qing, but to, rather to that of the PRC. Yet in this context, it is ironic that some of the close parallels in family institutions as between Taiwan and Hebei provided on the one hand, a ready framework for my Hebei research and on the other, powerful evidence that social change under communist rule had hardly been as dramatic or revolutionary as imagined by many China watchers during the Maoist period, when that country was largely closed to outside observation. Indeed, the revolutionary transformation of China is largely a process of the past 30 years or so, and it is the kind of revolution hardly anticipated during the Maoist years, but one resembling in many ways Taiwan's transformation a generation earlier. Thus, the fact that at that time, in 1986, social change in the countryside had hardly gone as far as some had thought, such that Hebei village life was remarkably similar in many ways to what I saw in the Mainon Taiwan village 21 years before then, even as there were major differences. One similarity that sticks in my mind, and it's a totally minor one actually, and which can serve as an overall measure, is that in each village at, at that time, there was one family owning a motorcycle, while the bicycle was the main instrument of personal transportation. That is in, in Mainong in 1963, 64, and in Hebei in 1985. In China, subsequent changes, all following decollectivization and the other post-Mao reforms, were in a context very different from the ones seen to have been characteristic of China under Mao. This new era of reform and opening up, as it is, as it is commonly characterized, allowed for large areas of social space to be relatively free of state control or even intervention, at least as compared to circumstances during the Maoist era, during the Maoist era, yes. This meant first that anthropologists, both from China and from abroad, could now carry out field work in the PRC. More important, it meant that within rural and urban field settings, there were, there were large areas where participant observation might be more or less politically neutral in the perspectives of both the anthropologists and the government. There were major exceptions, of course. Anthropologists doing fieldwork among so-called minority communities, even though having official approval, were in situations ripe for political critique uh, uh, as with respect to publication. Again, the whole area of family planning was one where state intervention and control was vastly intensified, just as reform-style liberalization kicked off in other domains of social life. While anthropologists conducting fieldwork, especially in the countryside, could hardly avoid encountering family planning and its consequences, how they dealt with this, if at all, could have serious critical implications. But with liberalization came China's rapid modernization, by which I mean not only city dwelling, but also features such as residential arrangements concentrated in high-rise apartments with elevators and indoor plumbing, as well as heavy reliance on automobiles, as well as public transit. It is important to differentiate the urban as a city, which has figured in Chinese society for centuries and certainly throughout the imperial era from the modern urban. Likewise, urbanity, the expression of urban central lifestyles and values was hardly confined to cities during imperial times, and, but was distributed, especially among the elite across villages, towns and cities alike. Being precisely a reflection of the internet excuse me, being precisely a reflection of the interconnection between rural and urban, so characteristic, so characteristic of pre-treaty port, late imperial China. Fast forward to recent times, we can also see evidence of a modern urbanity expanding throughout China. Much of this reflects urban expansion as such, 
with the World Bank recording China's urbanization at 61% of its population in 2020. At the same time, there is modern urbanity's extension into the countryside, which is more limited, a reflection of the profound rural-urban contrast emerging after the opening war and the establishment of treaty ports during the Qing dynasty, and continuing with state, reinf state reinforcement throughout the Maoist era and still in evidence today. I'm referring to the urban-rural distinction. Yet much of the contemporary ethnographic literature on rural China does provide strong evidence of urbanity's penetration into the villages, even as these represent a shrinking portion of the population. One source is migratory labor, with villagers working in cities returning home after having absorbed values of commodification, consumption, and style. The spread of urbanity is represented, of course, by car ownership and even by such mundane conveniences as flush toilets, as described in interesting detail by Gonzalo Santos in his study of a Guangdong village published just a few weeks before this writing. Perhaps it is the very rapidity of social and economic change in China during recent years that makes matters such as life in high rises of heightened interest. The high rises and gated communities of China's new middle class engage the intention, among others, of Andrew Kipnis in Zoping Shandong uh, and Li Zhang in Kunming, Yunnan. The same fascination with change may apply to other aspects of contemporary life in China, such as having a car, as suggested by the very title of Junjiang's ethnography, Driving Towards Modernity. Yet even contemporary studies of subjects of classical anthropological interest gain freshness through their focus on change. This is certainly borne out in Andrew Kipnis's new book on funerals in China, in which he places his subject squarely in the context of China's urbanization. It is this urbanity, mainly within the urban, that is confronted in the recent anthropology of China. In his work on the urban penetration of the rural, Santos describes how community-based popular religion continues to thrive in the village, in spite of the growing impact of urban forces. The contrast is with apartment dwelling residents in a fully urbanized setting such as Guangzhou, where, as Jun Zhang tells us, the gated apartment complex where she was based during her fieldwork consists of several high rises and does not comprise a community. Rather, she says, those living there are involved in their own particular networks of social ties, having little to do with their immediate residential arrangements. Whatever their religious or secular orientations may be, these do not at all contribute to expressions of local residence-based solidarity. Somewhat of a contrast is represented by Robert Weller's finding in findings in Suzhou, where, according to him, the leveling of villages with their temples has led both, has led both to the villages' relocation to high-rise developments and, most interestingly, to the same relocation of their local gods. It remains to be seen, however, if the tight mix between local and religious solidarities can long survive an adjustment to life in multi-story multi apartment houses. Andrew Kipnis' study of the county-level city of Zoping in Shandong province adds the element of the immediate heritage of, of Maoism in, ra in rapid urbanization. In Zoping, he says, there are at least two forces working against the dissolution of residential solidarity under the impact of rapid urbanization. One is the so-called village in the city, where urban expansion has, has enveloped pre-existing villages such that they are maintained as social entities through various combinations of residence and collective rights to village property. Another major force maintaining localized communities in Zoping's urban setting is a direct legacy of the Maoist era's urban Danwe or work unit, whereby employment, residence, education, healthcare, and much else are all, all coalesced within one organizational framework. In Zoping, large conglomerates provide for some of their workers what Kipnis calls a Donway-like setting. However, Kipnis also takes note of commercially vi vi available high-rise developments in Zoping, where there is present the kind of anonymity and absence of residential solidarities noted at, by many as symptoms of modern urbanism. In China, as elsewhere, an apartment complex in a gated community of high-rises often will have an administrative committee dealing with local issues and financing. Here again, Junjiang points out how in the high-rise complex she is familiar with, each group has little or no social expression beyond its immediate administrative tasks, 
and that conflicts over such matters can result in different factions jockeying for support from residents. However, such alignments, once again, are issue related and will disappear once the issues are resolved or forgotten. All of this sounds almost absurdly familiar to a resident of Taipei or, for that matter, of Manhattan. Yes, yet in the context of China ethnography, it means as something fresh and of anthropological significance. This circumstance of itself deserves our attention. Indeed, Li Zhang's ethnographic account of the new urbanization in Kunming, based on fieldwork beginning shortly before Junjiang started hers, provides some of the basis <coughs> for the subject's anthropological excitement. In her account, the emergence of residents' administrative committees is linked to the conflicts in Kunming between residents and external building managers, usually the same as the original developers. Kipnis refers to Kunming as being notorious for such conflicts, but again, from my perspective as an apartment-dwelling New Yorker, all of this is well known, unfortunately, and to be expected. While Li Zhang describes emerging urban, urban patterns anticipating those dealt with by Jun Jing, she neatly identifies what is historically special about what she sees in Kunmi. Her main point is that the new middle class, whatever else it may be, is defined as, as much by residential arrangements in the form of gated communities with high rises, townhouses, or even individual homes, as it is by other attributes such as car ownership, commodification, and consumption orientation, and so forth. But what marks the special quality of this new middle class is its history. It is the product of the Maoist era's closure and its replacement by the comparatively freewheeling economy following the initiation of reform. Pre-communist China had for its time a modern middle class, to be sure, concentrated perhaps in Guangzhou and Shanghai, but with sprouts in other urban centers. But all of this gave way to the collectivized economy and society of the unit or Donway during the decades of Maoist rule. If the middle class is one urban product of post-Maoism, there are others. It is a credit to modern anthropology that one of its major concerns has been the margin. Be these the poor, a minority defined in ethnic or racial terms, or one characterized by, the, by these in varying combinations. For much of the recent anthropology of China, these concerns have appeared most commonly in rural studies, be they of environmentally or medically challenged Han Chinese communities, or of minorities pressured or disadvantaged in different ways. As far as the urban anthropology of China is concerned, the focus on marginality largely, but not exclusively, has involved rural urban population movements. In some cases, the movement involves ethnic minorities, as analyzed, for example, in uh, Liu Xiaohua's work among the North Sao in Yunnan. Yet much of urban anthropology of the marginalized has, has focused on Han migratory labor, as in the studies, among others, of Rachel Murphy and Zhang Qi, and Li Zhang's work in Beijing, with Andrew Kipnis giving some space to this subject in his Zoping ethnography. In an interesting way, an effort to place a comparative perspective to the matter of rural urban migratory labor might reveal the importance of the non-traditionalist anthropology carried out in Taiwan by only a minority of foreign scholars during the height of the era of traditionalism. I had in mind, among other researchers, the important work done by Bernard and Rita Gallen on social change in rural Taiwan and on village migrants working in urban factory settings. It is ironic that the significance of their research might be better appreciated today than during the 20th, 20th century decades when a major focus of Taiwan anthropology among foreign scholars was on Chinese late imperial culture. Absent from mid 20th century rural urban migration in Taiwan was a, absent, sorry, absent from mid 20th century rural urban migration in Taiwan was a factor looming very large in such migration across the Taiwan Straits. The ongoing presence of the rural urban divide formed and maintained by China's household registration system, or HUKO. This is not to say that Taiwan lacked household registration. Indeed, Taiwan's, Taiwan's household registration is anthropologically famous as through the work of Zhuang Ying Zhang, Burton Pasternak, John Shepard, Arthur P. Wolfe, and many others. As in China, Taiwan's household registration was introduced as an instrument of surveillance and control. In the case of Taiwan, by the Japanese colonial authorities who brought it over from their home country. Having had the opportunity to take 
very close looks at both the Japanese and post-Japanese Taiwan household registration forms and data during my field work in 1964 and 1971, as well as having the opportunity to examine such material from villages in Sabe in 1985 and Sichuan in 1990, I can report that the Taiwan versions are far richer with respect to the data they contain for each individual and household. What the Taiwan records lack, however, is the Maoist twist given those of mainland China. During the Maoist era, this involved giving each person a class label and a designation as a rural or urban person. In post-Maoist times, the class labels are gone, but the rural and urban designations remain. The issue of those in China with rural household labels living and working in urban cities is a major concern of much of the rural urban migration literature. The absence of such labels as impinging factors in Taiwan's earlier rural urban movements, together with other differences, makes for potentially useful comparisons, and it also highlights the value that more non-traditionalist research on Taiwan might have had for a fuller comparative perspective on urbanization and social change in China today. The extremely rapid emergence of the entire assemblage of post-Mao middle-class traits brings to mind what the sociologist Chan Kyuk Suk refers to as compressed modernity, referring in the first instance to South Korea, whose middle class emerged from an historical context very different from that of China's. He characterizes development such as we see in both countries as compressed modernity, because in his view, they both display, and I quote, a civilizational condition in which economic, political, social, and cultural changes occur in an extremely condensed manner in respect to both time and space, and in which the dynamic coexistence of mutually disparate historical and social elements leads to the construction and reconstruction of a highly complex and fluid social system. At a purely descriptive level, with compressed modernity, Chang Kyung Sup is proposing a framework of comparison which readily could accommodate Taiwan as well as South Korea and China. The obvious questions are what they otherwise share in common and how they are different. But an even more important question is the extent to which China's recent ethnographic record was suffi has sufficient matchup with those of Taiwan, not to speak of other areas of the world, to allow for such comparisons and to draw from them findings of even greater anthropological interest. It's important to keep in mind that about the time that China opened up to anthropological fieldwork by foreigners as well as by locals, Taiwan was already in the midst of the compressed modernity that was only later to characterize China. As noted, this first phase of post mao fieldwork was largely rural, even as in Taiwan, the massive social and economic transformation was well underway. I remember stressing at that time that what was happening in Taiwan was far more revolutionary than anything going on in China. There was massive expansion of Taiwan's middle class, the rapid spread of car ownership, of modern housing, of high-rise apartment complexes, the transformation of family life, and all the other themes that loom so large in the current ethnographic literature on China. Yet all of this did not attract much anthropological attention, which was now focused on rural China. Others, such as the sociologists Thomas Gold, Michael Xiao, Robert Marsh, and Ezra Vogel, indeed noted and dealt with what was called the Taiwan miracle, or the Taiwan economic miracle, in reference to the island's rapid industrialization and economic growth, especially during the final quarter of the 20th century. And this was as it developed alongside Singapore, South Korea, and Hong Kong, with Taiwan now known as one of the four Asian tigers. But while sociologists and economists might focus on Taiwan's transformation, anthropological attention had moved to China. If China's recent early 21st century rapid urbanization was mind-boggling, to use a term I've drawn from the ethnography of that very subject, why was this not true of Taiwan's transformation in almost all areas? Urbanization, commodification, car ownership, education, metamorphosis into a or de determinately or dominantly middle-class society, and so much more, including the overwhelming mechanization of agriculture. The question is important not just with respect to a critical analysis of anthropological research in China and Taiwan and China, but also in regard to the more fundamental issue of the nature of the ethnographic gains. As I have stressed, 
the foreign anthropologists in Taiwan during the era of traditionalism, for the most part, saw imperial China. In some cases, this was obvious and explicit, as with my work, noted above, or with the late Arthur P. Wolf's classic article on gods, ghosts, and ancestors, with each of these categories tightly connected to social domains during late imperial times. In other cases, the association between the Taiwan ethnography and China of the Qing dynasty was left vague, but the issues addressed, such as kinship relations or lineage organization, were framed in terms of the earlier literature dealing with the Qing. Sources such as Justice Doolittle's 1985, sorry, 1965 book on the social life of the Chinese, or Reginald Fleming Johnson's Lion and Dragon in Northern China, published in 1910, loom large among the backup literature. I do not mean to suggest that the anthropology of the traditionalist period was sloppy or erroneously oriented scholarship, for it did indeed contribute much to what it set out to do, to enhance knowledge of imperial Chinese culture. My point, rather, is that it had a particular focus, one that had obvious relevance to aspects of Taiwan culture as, in, as encountered by the anthropologists. But this encounter was hardly fortuitous. Let us imagine a valley somewhere in northern Taiwan during the 1950s and 1960s, where there was located a large electronics plant and a small earth god shrine, Tudigong. Should an anthropologist enter that valley, what would attract the greater part of this anthropologist's attention? I can assure you that at that time, on the basis of my personal experience, and in terms both of my own interests and my familiarity with colleagues doing fieldwork there, it certainly would not have been the electronics plant. Of course, times have changed, and it, was in, and it was the ethnography of an electronics plant in Taiwan that was indeed the subject of an excellent uh, anthropology dissertation in 2015. One might argue sim that simply due to its own massive transformation, Taiwan now has much less to offer in the way of fieldwork opportunities for directly enhancing our appreciation of Chinese culture during the Qing dynasty, even if there were an interest in that kind of fieldwork. Thus, anthropological interest in contemporary Taiwan means interest in Taiwan as such, and the value such a focus may have for broader understandings. If traditionalism saw a lineal connection between what was viewed ethnographically and late imperial culture, the post-traditional vision is of contemporary Taiwan in a regional or global setting involving lateral connections with comparisons highlighted by parallel or contrasting processes. However, if such comparisons wish to account for and analyze differences as well as similarities, a focus on origins may also be called for, perhaps involving an approach along the lines of the recombinant social change suggested by Kipnis in his study of Zhou Ping, recombinant social change. In other words, even if many of the elements leading to the emergence of the modern middle class are shared across borders in China, Taiwan, East Asia, and beyond, the end product is not uniform uniformity precisely because, that, because the cultural configurations preceding the onset of these changes differs from case to case. What the notion of recombinant social change asserts is that some pre-existing social factors are powerful enough to have a continuing and differentiating influence even after the powerful new forces for change come into play. As far as the connections between China and Taiwan are concerned, traditionalist anthropology look to the past, but not for the purpose of accounting for changes up to the present. As far as present day commonalities are concerned, a recombinant approach can yield different outcomes depending on the historical depth of factors held to have a formative impact. The impact of the Maoist era on post-Maoist developments such as with the uh, urban Donway system, might be expected to produce unique Chinese, unique China residential arrangements in addition to those characteristic of other modern urban settings. Digging more deeply, however, may reveal features in the results of recombinant social change shared well beyond the present day borders of China. I suggest that one such potentially rewarding area of comparison relates to the collapse of fertility which, as is well known, is occurring in many parts of the world. However, this global record points to something special about East Asia. For the moment, 
keeping the comparison limited to Taiwan and mainland China. Major phases in the transformation leading to this crisis include simplification of family structure with the increasing dominance of the nuclear family as the unit of household composition and supported by the growing desire on the part of young people for greater, greater privacy and independence. My own fieldwork in Taiwan, as well as in mainland China, suggests that the turn towards privacy and individualization began to take hold in Taiwan decades before appearing in China, even though it was in China that this transformation received major anthropological attention, as in the works of Yen Yun Xiang, among others. Again, we have this transformation placed in the same ethnographic setting as other aspects of the emergence of the middle class and contemporary in the anthropology of China. In Taiwan, as later in China, this trend was also supported by the ongoing transformation of the economy from family-based labor-intensive agriculture to salaried salary employment away from farming. In addition, supporting this transition has been the near total mechanization of agriculture in Taiwan, once again anticipating or even predicting later developments in China. In Taiwan, linked to the emergence of the conjugal family as the basic unit of domestic life, has been a drastic reduction in the fertility rate. Again, followed in China by the more recent trend in the same direction. During the past several years, Taiwan's fertility rate has consistently been lower than China's, in spite of China's state-enforced policy of birth limitations. In terms of ranking, Taiwan's birth rate for the past several years has been among the world's lowest when, com when compared with that of other regions. In 1970, the fertility rate of Taiwan was 3.9, ranking 138 out of 199 locations, the lowest, out of 199, with 199 being the lowest. By 2013, Taiwan's rate had plummeted to 1.1, ranking 210 out of 210. In other words, Taiwan was the lowest ranking, uh, uh, lowest ranking uh, region uh, in terms of fertility uh, uh, in, in 2013. In 2018, Taiwan ranked 203 out of 209 with a rate of 1.2, according to the Population Reference Bureau. But the CIA has Taiwan 222 out of 224, still with the fertility rate at 1.1. Now, I'm going to show a table here uh, to... Go. Oh, here we are. Okay, good. All right. I just want to. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, here we go. If you see this table here, um, many reasons have been posed for, for the drop in fertility, such as the high cost of education and lack of government supported daycare. Such factors are indeed at work globally, but not only in Taiwan. I suggest that in addition to such pressures, there are circumstances peculiar to Taiwan and elsewhere as in East Asia. As can be seen from this table, Fertility collapse in Taiwan is quite similar to trends in Hong Kong, Macau, Singapore, and South Korea. We have here uh, two, uh, two ranking arrangements. One is, the, is for the Population Reference Bureau. The other is the CIA World of, uh, Factbook. Uh, these are standard reference, re reference sources uh, for these kinds of statistical issues. Now, you have... Uh, Reference Bureau listing gives 209 world regions. Of these 209 world regions, the uh, China is number 188. That is already very low, but it is but it is still considerably higher than those even lower than that. And here we have a uh, a cluster involving South Korea, Macau, Hong Kong, and Taiwan and Singapore. Once again, if we look at the CIA World Factbook, we find a similar clustering here. Uh, but in the case of the CIA's 2021 listing, Taiwan is the lowest, uh, and it's 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 uh, 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 
four from four from below us in terms of the population reference bureau. These these differences are not really significant. What I think is very significant is the fact that how all of the the uh, China heritage areas are all at the bottom, uh, with China itself approaching the bottom. And of course, the difference here is that in China, the middle class is relatively new. Okay, so there's something going on here with, that relates somehow to the middle class and fertility collapse, in, with particular reference to the China or East Asian uh, context. Now, as, as can be seen uh, from this table, fertility collapse in Taiwan is similar, as I mentioned, to trends in Hong Kong, Macau, Singapore, and South Korea, all sharing in common a Confucian heritage stretching patriarchy and patrilineality. Moreover, what these regions also share, in contrast to China, is an absence of government policy enforcing fertility reduction. China and Japan are well among those areas with the lowest fertility rates globally, even though uh, ranking slightly higher than those at the very bottom. Okay, now, I'm trying to get out of here. Okay. Okay, now I want to I want to return to uh, Okay, here we are. So uh, now that China has expanded uh, uh, allowable children to three, in effect eliminating all family limitations, we can see that th this is a reaction to the fact that China has now joined the other East Asian areas and experiencing draft drastic fertility reduction. This was highlighted in a January 6, 2020 New York Times online report entitled, Births in China Fall to Lowest Level in Nearly Six Decades. The first paragraph reads as follows. The number of babies born in China last year, which is 2019, fell to a nearly six decade low, exacerbating a looming demographic crisis that is set to reshape the world's most populous nation and threaten its economic vitality. Almost 14.6 million babies were born in China in 2019, according to the National Bureau of Statistics. That was nearly 4%, that was nearly a 4% fall from the previous year and the lowest official number of births in China since 1961, the year of widespread famine. The same article went on to note that the fertility rate in 2019 was 1.6, but the World Population Review gives China the slightly higher fertility rate of 1.69 for that year, ranking 156 out of 200. For Taiwan, that year's rate is 1.15, ranking 199 out of 200. As China's fertility trend moved towards Taiwan's, the Chinese government's drive to reduce population growth has been replaced by one advocating more marriage and more children. As Ayo Walbert has aptly put it, the Chinese government has gone, now I quote, has gone from family planning to family making. What China now also shares with the other East Asian areas is a large middle class, as we have seen. Bringing in the recombinant perspective I mentioned earlier, we can look at declining fertility and middle class emergence in conjunction with pre-existing factors in an East Asian context. One major factor is still is the still prevalent bias in China, whereby, as Kipnis put it, in reference to Zoping's new middle class, kinship relations are still imagined in a patrilineal fashion. More generally, the ethnographic literature confirms how there is a continuing strong patrilineal bias in terms of property, marriage, and the desirability of male offspring. Yet this literature also records a dramatic rise in the status of women. In fact, these circumstances describe all of the East Asian regions with extremely low fertility rates. It almost seems counterintuitive that societies where traditional Confucian values, including an emphasis on the importance of male offspring, have historically been dominant, that, sorry, let me just repeat this. It, it seems almost counterintuitive that societies where traditional Confucian values, including an emphasis on the importance of male offspring, have historically been dominant, that, you, that where that fertility collapse should be most extreme. 
I suggest it is precisely the endurance of such values in the face of the contradictory enha enhancement of women's status that is importantly behind drastic birth, birth rate decline. Fertility is decreasing globally and improvements in the economic and educational status of women are well understood to be the major driving factors. Nevertheless, these kinds of pressures appear to be most extreme in the East Asian areas. As far as this part of the world is concerned, because women increasingly are able to make choices of their own regarding higher education, occupation, and an independent lifestyle, the continuing presence of male-centered family orientations represents a situation they would rather avoid either by postponing marriage or remaining single. Thus, thus to give only one example, Zachary Howlett reports in his new book how in a backlash against patrilineal and patriarchal attitudes, more women are delaying marriage and how women's diligence to, in educational endeavors are a pushback against patriarchal norms in China. Late marriage, of course, means fewer children for those who do finally obtain a spouse. The clash between emergent values and those historically present turns the notion of recombinant change on its head, because rather than integrating the old factor of dominant patrilineality with the new one of emergent women's status transformation, the present assemblage of cultural norms present women and men in the East Asian region with contradictory options regarding marriage and reproduction. As far as attention to the ethnic Han in Taiwan and China is concerned, what has been constant in anthropological circles is the overwhelming dominance of interest in China. This has been the grand continuity as between traditionalism and the anthropology of Taiwan and post-traditionalism in the anthropology of the China mainland. Whether or how this change, whether or how this will change due to recent political de developments or to the impact of COVID-19 remains to be seen. But perhaps there is room for anthropologists to take matters into their own hands, especially in consideration, in consideration of the various issues uh, connected with contemporary trends in urbanization and the middle class. While it is obvious, while it obviously is the case that an anthropologist can only do one ethnography at a time, the moment may have arrived to expand what I have called the ethnographic gaze to bring into one's vision the various regions of East Asia, certainly including Taiwan and China. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, so Mario, would you like to speak something before the QA session starts? Or No, I think that uh, I've said I everything don't. I wanted to say. Okay. Be, okay. Okay. Microphone. Thank you for your very inspiring article. And I think uh, the comparative the comparative insights between Taiwan studies and the present day China study is really, I think it's really thought provoking. And I, I think um, maybe audience on site and online would like to raise some comments or questions to Professor Myron Cohen. Uh, Professor Zhang Xin. Um, Professor Myron Cohen, <laughs> good night to you in New York time. Um, it's good to see you online. And last time when we met each other in Taipei was about uh, eight years ago. Right, together, okay. Yeah, together with uh, Professor Huang Su Ming and Sao Hua. Right, uh, right. In secret. Yeah, I, I, I thank you for reviewing several excellent works and books on contemporary China's social change and the rise of middle class and reminds both sides of Taiwan scholar to Taiwan Strait scholar to have a broader perspective to study Chinese society. And also I admire your uh, brave that you almost have a confession that in 1960 to 80, anthropologist who comes from Western world to study Taiwan, 
looking at Taiwan from the perspective of traditionalism. And right. they are not pay attention to the social change so rapidly in Taiwan during that time. But you mentioned that Professor Li Yuan, who would criticize Morris Freeman's uh, framework and will, would look at the change of Taiwan's re religion or the household family structure. Mm -hmm. So thank you for uh, speaking out or uh, having this review for us. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Hey, Myron. Yes, yes. I, I see Professor Shu Binghua is online. I think uh, Professor Huang, are, are you ready to speak to, to raise question or speak? Uh, yes. Hi, Maren. How are you? Hello there. How should we? Yeah. Good to uh, see you. Yeah. Good to see you too. Yeah. Now, it's interesting that you uh, look at uh, the rise of middle class in the contemporary China. Uh, if we have, uh, we can look at historical context. Uh, we see that the rise of middle class. Uh, regardless it happened in England or even in Taiwan in 1970s, uh, was the uh, movement toward uh, political autonomy by this particular group. That is when, uh, with the rise of middle class, uh, we began to see uh, grassroots organ organizations uh, beginning to propose their own social agenda right. uh, to the political authority. And, uh, you know, that's why uh, part of my interest in contemporary China is to look at uh, this type of uh, grassroots uh, social organizations, uh, such as uh, the NGOs, uh, mm -hmm. how they develop and then how they have been coerced by the political regime uh, to curtail their activities. Right. Uh, in in uh, China, however, it seems uh, the the development uh, doesn't really follow uh, the historical tracks that we have been seeing uh, in the past. Uh, in other words, uh, we see the well, political scientists use the term fragment authoritarianism to describe China. But somehow this fragmentation doesn't seem to be appearing. It seems mm -hmm. that uh, there have been more and more coercive uh, power uh, to, bring, to bring in uh, grassroots uh, citizens' organizations. Right. So uh, do you see that as a uh, kind of a deviation or uh, some kind of uh, a historical development. You're right. Well, I think yeah, I think it's a great question. I think first of all, I would say that uh, uh, everything you say, of course, is precisely based on the comparative perspective. Right. And which is, I mean, that that is essential. In other words, uh, and that's one of the things I'm pushing for. Uh, how, what, what the comparison is going to yield is a, is is a set of different questions. But you have to start with that, and and, and so and so that in in effect. Uh, What's happening in China uh, actually, in a way, poses a kind of a threat to theories which say certain developments are inevitable, because the, you you can you, have, you can have counter movements that you've just described. So, for example, the the the, uh, uh, the suppression of NGOs in China uh, uh, it relates, of course, to the to the authoritarian nature nature of the of the regime, uh, and of course. In, in a way, they, some of the, the political scientists, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, or maybe even more recently, some of them, I think perhaps rather naively, would say, well, once China has the middle class, you're going to have democracy. That, people were saying that. Uh, and of course, that's not exactly the way things have, <laughs> that's not exactly the way that things have turned out. So, uh, yeah. so once again, uh, uh, you know, I think that the Chinese case may cause, may necessitate a lot of rethinking in many different directions. Uh, and the uh, uh, and I put you know and I think a case might be made that there are other uh, uh, middle class societies in parts of say Eastern Europe 
that are moving in similar directions to China, as a matter of fact. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that makes it all that makes it so that so then so then so then maybe the question becomes, why is it that, that you do have these these differential developments, even at the same time that in so many other ways you have similarities, you know, cars, high rise, it's all there, it's all there, commodification, it's all there, but all of the all of the uh, neat political uh, 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 manifest political consequences of this don't turn out the way you expect it. So what's going on? I can't answer your question, but I certainly agree with you that it's, that it's one of the most important questions we have today. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Hi. Um, is there anyone in this room um, who would like to raise questions? Or, uh, uh, and Derek, you have interviewed Professor Martin Calhoun, right? <laughs> any words to share? Or any reflections during the interview that you would like to share with all of us? And Tai Shi Shu is. 台史所正在做一個口述史的計劃,針對這一項像Professor 呃, hi, hi, Myron. How are you? <laughs> um, this is Derek Sheridan. Yes. Um, um, I just don't. I don't really um, have a particular um, question per se. But um, but yes, um, the uh, North American Taiwan Studies Association, in co in collaboration with the Institute of Taiwan History, um, we've been doing a um, an oral history project um, for the past uh, seven years, actually. Um, interviewing um, Myron Cohen as well as other um, anthropologists from the generation that, um, that you call um, the traditionalists uh, and, and the kind of work they did in Taiwan in the uh, 50s, 60s, and, um, and, and 70s. And we, and we hope that that oral history collection will, uh, will be published uh, soon, although it, you know, publishing an oral history takes a, a bit of time. It takes a bit of editing. <laughs> Um, but I guess, a, a I guess maybe a question maybe that I might I might have is, um, is um, is it, I guess it's the kind of maybe it's the question of um, of sort of uh, cite citations I guess is a question. Um, given that. Um, you know the, the traditionalist anthropology of uh, Taiwan um, had played such a a role in sort of the development of uh, the um, North American anthropology of China, especially during the 80s and the 90s. That you know one finds in these ethnographies um, that were published in China about China in the 1990s. Oftentimes the references will go back to work done in Taiwan in the 60s and in the 70s. Um, but I'm wondering. If, uh, from your perspective, how does the citation of work done in Taiwan, how, how, how has that changed as well? In other words, um, as especially if, within, as the anthropology has developed in China itself, for example, among um, Chinese anthropologists studying Chinese society, um, to what extent do they still sort of cite or sort of dialogue with the older traditional anthropology in Taiwan? in the uh, 1960s and the 1970s. I um, think that, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, as, I, as I've said in other contexts, uh, traditionalism morphed into historical anthropology, which, which is a field in its own right. And I, in fact, my main work falls in that category right now, in which the issue is not, the issue is not using uh, 
Taiwan, field work in Taiwan to understand Qing China, but, uh, but going beyond that and looking either in Taiwan or elsewhere uh, of, of, at the actual historical material that you can still discover through field work, the documents and so forth. So to get back to your question, I would I would say that uh, among the historical anthropologists in in, uh, in China, uh, and this is a, a, a large field with da uh, 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 David Four has played a big role in it. Among the historical anthropologists in China and the, those in Taiwan, of course, the it's precisely those areas where the traditionalist field work uh, uh, gets the greatest attention because that was the aim of the traditionalist field work to to make it contribute to the kind of historical anthropology of China. And that and that's where it's strong, but uh, I don't find too much comparison uh, 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 in terms of uh, modernization issues uh, uh, as between Taiwan and China, uh, I, especially in in, uh, in China. I don't see I don't uh, see much of that. I think one of the reasons is that is that this massive social change uh, that Taiwan underwent way before China that this massive social change was not really powerfully anthropologically recorded because the anthropologists were too busy looking at the Qing dynasty then. That's what I, that's what I think one of the uh, issues is. That's, a, that's about the best I can do for your uh, question. Yes. Thanks to Derek, question and Professor Cohen's answers. And and anybody would like to to raise uh, Melinda? So uh, my name is Linda Arago. I don't know if Myron Cohen remembers me from 40 years ago, but I studied uh, factory workers in Taiwan in the 1970s. Good, uh, good for you. <laughs> yeah, good for me. Yeah, uh, and a particular one focus of my study was fertility, and um, we have seen this huge fertility drop. But I guess I have two comments. One is that uh, I think your talk is focused a little too narrowly on this aspect of fertility and much more could be played out as to what has happened to inheritance, what has happened to family relationships. So I think there's, of course, you know, obviously a huge uh, field to look at this uh, an enemy and the difference of people living in high rises, you know, the change in the Chinese family. But I'd like to continue a little bit with what uh, Professor Huang Suming said in, comparison, in comparison of China and Taiwan, because we've seen both commodification, uh, money, uh, sort of breakdown of social of communities in both places. But the view in Taiwan is more or less that China is a dog-eat-dog -dog society. And I have to have, I have to say, I have my own impressions along that account that we, that there is a stereotype, but I think there is some solid basis for that stereotype, that China seems to have a kind of moral emptiness, that uh, the, uh, the cultural revolution broke down traditional religion, uh, the uh, modernization has broke down the family, and uh, this huge emphasis on money is perhaps even worse than in Taiwan, of course, with the big class differences within China. So I'd like you to comment on this big question is, do you see a kind of uh, moral uh, crisis or lack of values, lack of community values within China, especially as even we see the uh, social values of communism uh, almost absent now in any kind of social discourse. Okay, so let me enter, let me stop there with this very big question. All right, thank you. First of all, about the matter of fertility. You're quite right, it was a narrow focus, but in dealing, but in, in, in the context of a 20 page paper, I tried to focus on something that, that was had a certain dramatic quality to it, right? Obviously the implications go way beyond that. Uh, and uh, as far as the, uh, the, uh, the, the major issue that you allude to, sort of the, the moral quality of life in China. Let me first reintroduce this idea of recombinant change. Remember, the idea is that things change indeed, but they but some of the older elements are incorporated. And 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 this notion of recombinant change, I think, is one of the uh, is one of the uh, comparative wedges that one may uh, that one may uh, 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 employ. In, 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 in invoking this kind of, a, because your statement about China was excellently comparative. 
you're comparing it with something, obviously, which is correct. And again, so uh, uh, the uh, uh, and again, this follows from what uh, 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 Professor Huang uh, 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 mentioned earlier. Yes, I I, I have no doubt that uh, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, China's recent past, the Maoist era, has had a massive impact. And that impact continues to be felt in spite of all of, of a whole series of changes, which have interesting parallels elsewhere in the world. Yes, now, uh, uh, so I I, I tend to agree with you. Actually, but measuring measuring the nature of this kind of a situation, I think, is is, is rather complicated for me because uh, I've done field work, but. Uh, admittedly, uh, some, I did field work in Hebei in 1985. I did field work in uh, Sichuan and in, Shang, in the Shanghai area, not in Shanghai City, but in Shanghai County, which, which, which no longer exists, but now it's uh, the Minhang district, but it's next to, next to Shanghai City. The old, anyway, I did field work in both places in 1990, and uh, uh, I did not get that sense of of uh, uh, moral ennui, if you will, or uh, dog eat dog, uh, as being a major uh, a major factor. And now uh, maybe I was in the wrong place. Maybe I'm naive. Maybe I like to be optimistic. Uh, but uh, I, I I do think that uh, there is a struggle in China. There's a struggle that there's a, a real. It, it, it may be dog eat dog, but it's also a matter of uh, of economic and uh, social uh, uh, survival. So um, that's about that's about the, uh, the the best I can say. And I also would like to say that uh, I, I, you know, I, uh, as you said, as you said, your your earlier research, I think, was part of the uh, 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 of the uh, interesting uh, non-traditionalist uh, uh, anthropological uh, fieldwork, which uh, which of course uh, was totally in place at that time. Thank you. Are you okay with are you fine with me? Okay. So uh Maram Professor yes. David say hello to you from Halunu. Who? Did you see in the message? Since Before you think further for questions or comments, I, I would like to raise a question to Myron. Myron, I know you have paid close attention to the publications of China and the Taiwan ethnographies. So I, I'm curious about like uh, because you have looked at those publications for decades. Have you seen any difference or similarities about uh, uh, for for anthropologists of different national backgrounds in choosing topics or doing analysis? That's, well, uh, that's an interesting uh, uh, question. Um, I think uh, it, the, the uh, much of the uh, anthropological, much of the ethnographic uh, uh, literature dealing with issues of the uh, of the uh, uh, middle the newly emergent middle class and the, uh, the the new things such as such as such as driving or such as um, uh, 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 changes in patrilineality or uh, or or in, in one case a village study uh, uh, showing how how people uh, are beginning to prefer daughters uh, a lot of this a lot of this driving sensitivity, Towards dramatic change, in fact, is written by anthropologists 
of, of Chinese heritage. I say that because they come of varying background and, uh, and, and but many of them, um, many, if almost all of them that I'm referring to are educated in, in American or European uh, uh, setting. Well, some, are, some are in Hong Kong, but uh, I don't, uh, but to answer your question, I think that, uh, that I do detect a, let me put it this, let me put it this way. I'll put it this way, right. I, I detect that, that that just as the traditionalist in, in, during the height of the traditionalist era, uh, and this was these were American uh, American and, and European anthropologists. There, there was something almost there was something almost magical about traditional China. It was really magical. Well, I find that the same sense of magic is 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 in place in some of the contemporary ethnographies of of new uh, of, of middle class developments in China. But in this case, the magic is expressed more by people of Chinese background. Than of uh, of uh, uh, American or European background, but but everyone shares in common though a basically uh, Western uh, uh, anthropological education. That's about the best I can do to answer your question. How about recent publications, for example, like uh, uh, recent anthropological works on on China or, or Taiwan ethnographies? Hey. But I'm sorry, what is your question? I mean, like, um, as to the recent publications on China or Taiwan yes. ethnography, or Taiwan ethnographies, like, uh, I'm just, it's just a curiosity for me, like, because I think sometimes I read uh, for anthropologists of different national backgrounds or different cultural backgrounds, for example, like anthropologists um, Western anthropologist or uh -huh. a Chinese anthropologist or a Taiwanese anthropologist. Sometimes I, it seems to me that uh, people will have a certain tendency in choosing topics or doing analysis. Well, I think the, the, uh, if we look at some of the most recent, uh, 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 the, the ones I mentioned, for example, in, uh, in uh, my paper, which I deliberately tried to choose in most cases, uh, extremely uh, uh, recent uh, 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 works. Uh, I again, uh, I would say that. Uh, uh, let me just answer your question again, but put it in a slightly different fashion. Uh, the the uh, the ethnographies of um, that, that that I've read recently in terms of uh, of, of of the issues that I discuss in my uh, paper. I, as I say, uh, well, pe the, the people of say of Hong Kong background, or um, uh, which is interesting, Hong Kong background, or or uh, uh, especially a uh, uh, Hong Kong background, uh, or or China or Taiwan background, as a matter of fact, uh, but in, in terms of their uh, field work in mainland China, they again they they tend to look at. Uh, at the kinds of things I mentioned in my uh, in my talk just now, as almost having a magical, fantastically interesting quality to it, uh, and of course it is it is interesting. But we're asking about um, what I call the ethnographic gaze, whereas uh, the the people of American background uh, uh, tend to uh, uh, not have so much this, this the sense of of of, of magic in, in this, but have a more general. They they, they come in as a more generalized. Uh, a vision and try and try more. I think to put it in comparative perspective. But all this is teasing the issue, and I'm teasing the issue in response to your question, because to, at a more general level, in spite of all the differences, I think there are vast commonalities these days in terms of the ethnographies of uh, contemporary uh, contemporary China. Uh, and I think one of the reasons is, of course, that we have uh, a lot of a lot of intercommunication. Uh, in, in 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 these in these anthropological uh, circles, but uh, I am more impressed, as it were, by the by the commonalities than I am by the differences. But if asked to tease out the differences, I can make suggestions like the one I just made. Um, I think I think that is uh, 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 you know put it another way. Uh, wow, wow, this is fantastic. They have cars now. Wow, something like that. All right, and I, and and that of course is 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 one is 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 part of the. Uh, the transformation that I've been talking about. Thank you. Um, 
Gucci. Byron disappeared. <laughs> Can't see. Hi, Byron. Were you still there? Hi, how hi. Hi, hi, I'm Zichi, your former student. Okay, so oh, I have yes, a question yes, yes. about... I can't hi. recognize anybody with the face. All right, fine. Hello. <laughs> uh, good, okay. Okay, so my question is about anthropological teaching. And I'm wondering, as a young teacher, how should we bridge the traditionalism with the post-traditionalism? As, as, as I was a student with you, I, I think the major lecture you gave to me is that I, for, I, I forgot too much about traditionalism. So you always remind me of traditionalism. And I feel like this is, is there something I should do to my students? And I just always feel, I don't know, just how to better bridge uh, traditionalism and post-traditionalism as you demonstrate in this lecture. But I mean, in terms of teaching. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, I, the, 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 the pedagogical issue, first of all, uh, uh, it, it's, it, it's a very interesting question because uh, uh, at the gra and when I teach, when I used to teach graduates, I say used to, this, I just retired, so I've, I've stopped teaching, but that, this is this one this past semester. But when I, uh, would, when I would teach graduate courses on China, I, the, it, and this of course proves the, proves the point, most of the Taiwan ethnographies were in my course on traditional China, not on modern China. Okay, and then the 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 and and, and the courses on modern China had very little of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, Taiwan uh, uh, literature in it, at, at, and that's at the graduate level. Uh, at the undergraduate level, I'm, I I I make a much uh, I blur it much more. I, I I bring in the Taiwan ethnographies and the and the China ethnographies in, in terms of categories, you know, gender, uh, urban, urbanization, I, uh, Taipei is fine, uh, Guangzhou is fine, and so forth. At the undergraduate level, I emerge, uh, I but on the other hand, uh, there's an, an additional pedagogical issue, of course, namely that to what extent do you, if you're teaching a course on East Asia, it's much easier to bring it all together. If you're teaching a course on Taiwan, it, 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 which, which I've taught, you teach a course on Taiwan, you stay within the Taiwan domain as far as the ethnographic literature is concerned, and you wind up with 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 traditional with traditional as a phase in Taiwan anthropology and post-traditionalism with contemporary Taiwan anthropology. And then as far as China is concerned, contemporary China is concerned, you stay within that framework. If you're dealing with, with, with East Asia, it becomes much easier to uh, blend all these things and throwing in uh, uh, Tokyo and perhaps Seoul. Uh, uh, into the uh, into the comparative effort, so that that's about the that's about the uh, the best I can answer. If you're teaching a course on the history of China anthropology, then of course it's obvious how you want to. It's not obvious, but it, it's there's a it, it becomes one of the issues becomes traditionalism, post traditionalism, uh, historical anthropology, so on and so forth. So really, it depends on what kind of a course you you are uh you are teaching not to speak of any of the political issues involved which i'm not going to deal with now thank you for praising um cohen uh, my name is yen che tin i have been doing the study of the david jordan's village so i know your long story i know your background very much i, I hear is only a comment uh, I, I appreciate you mentioned about the, the, the decline of the birth rate. I, I see a parallel phenomenon in Taiwan because in Taiwan have a most powerful Buddhist nun in Taiwan. So it's a, because the, the, the patriarchal, patriarchal system cannot tolerate those uh, women in the family system when they enhance their status, woman status. So they, they have no way to out. They only go to a higher educated woman. A lot of women go to the Buddhist association, but go to the Buddhist uh, order, and uh, it's a kind of parallel phenomena. But after they leading the NGO, NGO or Buddhist NGO, they still emphasize the, the family value. They, they uh, pro, still pro, in, in pro, uh, enhance the Buddhist value in the whole society. So it's a continuum of the family value. But the Buddhist a very it's the most powerful Buddhist phenomenon in Taiwan is based upon those 
woman, high educated woman, but they cannot uh, stay in a patriarchal family system and, and they go to a, a Buddhist order to enhance their mm. woman status in the other way. Mm. I thought uh, only a comment there. Okay, yeah, I mean that uh, that that is a, that that is another uh, that is one variant, indeed, of the uh, of the response. Yes, that's part, that that is, I think. Yes, thank you. That is part of the the broader trend I was trying to mention. Yes, in fact, you had uh, in China you had traditionally you had these 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 religious women's religious movements which were which were very explicitly anti marriage. Of course, this is something. It's not the subject of today's talk, but uh, uh, it, it, it still follows along those lines. Uh, hello, Professor Men uh, Cohen. Uh, uh, I'm Yepo Huang from. Uh, Institute of Ethnology, and I'm my research, I did my field work uh, in Japan. Uh, it's about a new religion like a Tendikyo. And uh, one of my research results is that the, the birth of a Tendikyo in Taiwan uh, has its uh, historical root, um, like uh, 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 Japanese 40 years colonization in Taiwan from 1895 to 1945. And uh, as you mentioned in your, in this paper, in the last uh, paragraph, you mentioned uh, maybe the last sentence, you, you say, uh, you call the, uh, you call the ethnographic guest to bring one vision the various region of East Asia, certainly including Taiwan and China. I believe you also mentioned South Korea and Japan, which uh, right. is worse that, uh, I mean, for us here or the, in the region of uh, uh, East Asia, so we can do some comparative, I mean, not only re, uh, geog geographically, but also historically. Right. Uh, doing some kind of uh, integrative interdisciplinary research on this region. Uh, and so my, my question is that, um, uh, do you think the, the Japan 50 years, I mean, some kind of legacy have some, I mean, uh, uh, value or, um, you know, uh, intellectual uh, or scholarship that is worth for uh, do some uh, comparative study or research. I mean, for uh, in this region, particularly in the uh, uh, in in my institute, for further research. For for example, um, uh, in terms of the Mazu uh, you know, pilgrimage, uh, Professor Zhang Xun is this uh, is a, is the one of the specialists in this uh, topic, right? We saw the. Uh, we see the Mazu's pilgrim quite very famous in this uh, in Taiwan, right? And but also in China. And uh, I wonder, and I mean, in Japan, there's <laughs> so many, you know, uh, festival or pilgrimage like, you know, uh, 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 ritual activity uh, taking place there. And uh, for example, in Shindo, Shindo, Shindo's uh, pilgrimage. It sounds in that par parallel to Maju's, uh, you know, the, you know, circular pattern, you know, yes. from one village to other. So there's uh, some kind of um, similar pattern going on there. But, you know, as a specialist, like a historical um, anthropologist like you, I wonder if you have any uh, comment on this uh, phenomenon or oh, any suggestion for us to look into this, you know, is there any similarity between Shindo's pilgrimage and, uh, and that of a Mazu pilgrimage in Taiwan? So what would be your suggestion? Suggestion for this? Thank you. This is my question. Well, uh, um, your question, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit not quite in that field of uh, at the more general level, I think uh, a comparative study of uh, 
popular religion is 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 absolutely appropriate and test and, and especially in, 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 in in an East Asian context where, and so I would encourage it. And as far as the, uh, uh, a, a, a more detailed comparison of the, of the, uh, of the two traditions you mentioned, I think it's totally, it's, it's totally legitimate and it could be uh, very, very, uh, uh, very, very uh, revealing. Um, and, and I think, I think that, uh, but, you know, obviously uh, comparative research involves an equal focus on on, sim on similarities and uh, and differences, and as you as you suggest, I think that a historical dimension for the kind of research that you're suggesting would, would obviously be in place. But but in terms of comparative uh, comparative uh, research across East Asian societies, I think someone in your position who uh, who, I, who obviously knows uh, but, uh, can handle both Chinese and Japanese with 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 with, with total fluency. You're, you're, it's, 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 it's that kind of linguistic skill that are simply a prerequisite in order to engage at the, at the comparative level that you are focusing on. And certainly I would, I would encourage that you push it and see what, what finally comes out of it. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank you for, for mentioning this, but we always compare uh, Chinese pilgrimage to Western pilgrimage, Catholic in Europe. And we seldom compare uh, pilgrimage in Taiwan with Japan. Because if we want to do that, maybe um, we have to do with the Taiwanese Buddhist pilgrimage to compare with Japanese Buddhist uh, pilgrimage, not Mazu. I think it's, it's different. So. <laughs> So thank you. I only regret that I'm not there with you. That's not the tent. That, that cannot be. That cannot. That cannot be. Uh, uh, there's no way I could do that. But anyway, thank you. It's, and uh, again, thank you very much for having me and for hearing me out. So I should uh, say. Aaron, yeah, we will we'll let you to go to bed quickly. But before that, uh, oh. can everybody online show your face, and then we can have a collective picture. But. Take the photo, take the group photo together. Uh, yes. Myron, Professor yes. Lee's son is also online. Uh, I, I just want to thank you for Professor oh. Cohen's speech and say hi. Okay. Okay, fine. Oh, oh, good, good. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Hi. How are you? Yeah, how are you? Fine, thank you. Thank you for listening. Yes. Okay. So, uh, let's thank Professor Maren Kevin for this wonderful talk. And then it's already beyond your bedtime. So <laughs> after that, you can go. You can you can go to bed early. Fine. Yeah. Right. Right. It's. Okay. Thank you, okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You mean thank you. Yeah. Well, hopefully I'll see you next year in Taiwan. Yes, hopefully we've got <laughs> have a drink together. Yes. Yes. Oh, good. Right. All right. All right. Good morning. Good night. Yes. Good night to you. Good night. Good, good, night. good, good, night. To, good morning to you all. Good night to you. I'll email you later. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.